everybody. Thanks so much for joining us here this afternoon. We appreciate your time. My name is Katie Earl. I'm the coordinator of our University Express program, and we're joined here virtually with our speaker, Roseanne Hirsch. Thanks for being here, Roseanne. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for doing this with us. So we do have quite a few new folks on, so I'll quickly breeze through our housekeeping things. We are recording. We'll try to post it on our website in the near future if all goes as planned. You're muted without your video showing, and it's not because you've done anything wrong. That's just the settings for our program today. So as Rose goes through her presentation, feel free to type in any questions, comments, any memories you want to share right in our Q&A panel, and then we'll try to get to all of those at the end of her presentation. So if you're new to us, you'll find your Q&A panel located at the lower right-hand side of your screen if you're on a computer. Click on that, expand it, and send your questions to me. And then if you're on a tablet or smartphone, touch the screen. That brings up your control panel. You'll see a circle with three dots. Click on that, and there you'll find your Q&A. So we'd like to thank the sponsors of our program, which is my Department of Senior Services, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, the Excelsior Orthopedics, and Wegmans for all their support. And if you ever need anything at all, we're at Senior Services, and we're here to help you. We're at 858 8526. All right, so let's introduce our star of the show. Roseanne Hirsch is an amusement park historian and author of three books and numerous articles on the subject, including Crystal Beach Park. Growing up in Western New York, she had the opportunity to enjoy Crystal Beach every summer during her family's day trips to the park. A writer and carousel restorer, Roseanne currently resides in Niagara Falls, New York. Roseanne, thanks again for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, we can go ahead and get started. Uh, before we go um, too far in, I'd like everybody to know that the images you're about to see are from my collection and also from the generous contributions of my family and friends. So let us return to Crystal Beach. Next slide. In 1888, got it the beach. Next. Buffalonian John Evangelist Rebstock was an interpreter who had been one of the developers of Buffalo's Black Rock area. He was always looking out for a new project. He was attracted to Ontario's southern shore where rolling sand dunes 60 feet high kissed the edge of Lake Erie. He bought three waterfront farms with the intent to sell the sand to Buffalo construction companies. However, the idyllic beauty of the area inspired him to create a public entertainment venue instead. Next. Opening to the public in 1888, Repstock's religious campground was based on the educational lectures of the popular Chautauqua Institute. People traveled from all over western New York and southern Ontario to hear the top religious lectures of the day, sing hymns, and spend one or more nights in a rented tent. To relieve the severity of the religious lectures, he allowed sideshows of high quality to set up on the fringes of the camp. These included games of chance, gypsy fortune tellers, jugglers, sword swallowers, and a primitive hand-turned carousel. Soon more people were at the sideshows than the lectures. Next. Rebstock gave the people what they wanted. He abandoned the religious camp idea and in 1890 opened a summer resort that generations would come to know as Crystal Beach Park. Next. 1890, Buffalo's Coney Island. Next. The new resort was advertised as Buffalo's Coney Island. It had many different rides and attractions that enticed people to come to the park. Early rides such as the carousel, the razzle dazzle, and the Venetian swing seen here were powered by man or mule. Next. During the fledgling park's first seasons, mechanical rides, including a miniature steam train, replaced the primitive rides on the midway. Next, fun houses like the Bug House, the house that Jack built, and Spook Alley physically challenged patrons to navigate through spinning barrels over moving walkways and across slanted floors. Children and adults alike laughed and screamed on a steam-driven carousel with rocking horses, on the flying wicker baskets of the circle swing, and a slide called Bump the Bumps. Next. By 1900, mechanical rides were powered with gasoline or electric engines. This meant larger and more exciting rides like the Ferris wheel and Dodgems could be found on the midway. 
Next. Billiards, archery, bowling, games of skill, dancing, and roller skating were some of the activities visitors could enjoy. They could get their picture taken in Mr. Woolover's studio and buy a bag of caramel corn, candy kisses, or a sucker at the stand run by young Buffalonian George C. Hall. Next. To extend the visits to the resort, Rebstock built cottages on the sand dune above the beach. Patrons could rent cottages for overnight, a week, or the season. Several cottages could be bought outright. Rebstock recycled the old assembly house from the religious camp days by moving it to the beach. Renamed the Hotel Royal, it was remodeled into three stories of lakefront guest rooms with balconies, private baths, a restaurant, a spacious lobby, and an observation tower. A fire destroyed it in 1915. Next. While the rides are fun and interesting, the lake and beach were the main draw for Western New Yorkers trying to escape the city heat. Canoes and rowboats could be rented for an hour for fun on the lake. Next. A modern bathhouse was built above the beach with separate changing rooms and lockers for men and women. Sanitized bathing suits were rented by the hour or by the day. On the beach, a toboggan slide and a water swing, seen here, added thrills to those wishing to cool off. Next. In 1906, Rebstock suffered a typhoid attack that left him unable to run the park. He sold it to a group of businessmen from Cleveland. One of those men masterminded the grand alteration to the property that transformed it from a hodgepodge park to an organized midway that would mostly remain the same for the next 81 years. Next. A new boardwalk was laid from the pier down the shore along the length of the park. A running water system was installed, benches were added, and trees were planted down the midway and in the picnic grove. Next. Above the park on the sand dune opposite the pier, the Hotel Bonaire was built featuring a wraparound porch, a dining room, and guest rooms with views of Lake Erie. Advertisements of the time boasted that the Bonaire served the best fish fries on the lake. Next. From the first days of the resort, Rebstock had instituted ferry service between Buffalo and Crystal Beach. He made himself general manager and supervisor of the entire operation and occasionally staffed the customs booth himself. Next. Most of the vessels in the fleet were reconditioned or used watercraft, and they made several runs to other amusement parks around Lake Erie. The boats included the state of New York, seen in this photo, the Gazelle, the Idlewild, the Wyandotte, the Dove, and the Pearl. Next. A form of transportation ahead of its time, the Ontario Southern Railway was North America's first monorail. It was soon nicknamed the Pegleg because of the single post supporting the rail. The Pegleg ran from Ridgeway to Crystal Beach and back. It was powered by a battery that had to be recharged at each station. Next. The battery box originally hung below the car, so running over farmlands and roadways, the peg leg often encountered near misses with vehicles and occasionally collisions with livestock. Ridership on the peg leg was never as high as originally hoped, and the railway never turned a profit, so it was shut down after only two seasons of operation. Next. The Crystal Beach Boat. Next. In 1908, the Americana made its maiden voyage between Buffalo and Crystal Beach. She was the first steamship to be built specifically for leisure cruising on Lake Erie. She could carry 3,900 passengers across the lake in a single trip. One-way adult fare was 25 cents. Next. The Buffalo Dock at the foot of Commercial Street was always crowded as passengers who were unable to get aboard for the first trip of the day had to wait as long as three hours before the Americana returned to Buffalo to take them to Crystal Beach. Next. The, Amer the Canadiana joined the Americana on July 4, 1910. She was nearly identical to the Americana, and like her sister ship, her decks were teeming with passengers on every trip. Next. The Americana and Canadiana began alternate runs between Buffalo and Crystal Beach that day in 1910, and they would continue ferrying passengers along the watery route for the next 19 years. 
People considered the two ships interchangeable, and they were dubbed the Crystal Beach Boats. Next. The steamships were floating entertainment centers, and their patrons enjoyed every amenity during the one-hour-long journey across the lake. Each ship had a full wet bar, a snack bar, a photo booth, ice cream stand, and an open-air dance floor. A tiny dais for the orchestra headed the enclosed dance floor, which was the largest of any ship on the Great Lakes. Next. The ship's coal-fired triple expansion steam engines emitted enough power to send them clipping along the lake at up to 20 miles an hour. In addition to the Crystal Beach Buffalo Runs, the Canadiana made weekly stops in North Tonawanda at the foot of Thompson Street. Every Sunday throughout the summer, the Canadiana, packed with passengers, left Buffalo for a three-hour moonlight cruise. Next. The palatial steamers had been designed by well-known naval architect Frank Kirby. They were built by the American Shipbuilding Company in Buffalo. Grand staircases with ornately carved banisters and decorative lighting granted passengers access to all public decks. Next. Victorian salons and cabins were finished in mahogany and featured beveled mirrors, brass railings, stained glass windows, crystal and brass chandeliers, sculpted and gilded ceilings, paneled walls, and tiled floors. Next. Many orchestras, both American and Canadian, played aboard the Canadiana. One evening in 1923, a young Buffalonian by the name of Hyman Arluck, who was the band leader of the Southbound Shufflers, played his own composition during his band's break. Accompanying the song was a new dance step he created called the Jeep. The boat shook severely with the gyrations of the dancers, it nearly caused an international incident. From that day on, a sign on the dance floor proclaimed no jeeping, and jazz band dancing was banned from the Canadiana forever. Mr. Arlick eventually went to California, where he changed his name to Harold Arlen and composed such songs as That Old Black Magic and Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Next. The building of the Peace Bridge in 1927 gave Buffalonians direct access to Canada. Many found that driving was a quicker way to get to Crystal Beach than taking the boat. Steamship patronage began to drop. The Americano was sold in 1929 and ferried passengers from Battery Park in New York City to Long Island Amusement Park, Riot Playland. She was later sold to a concern in Baltimore, Maryland, where in 1959 she was sold for scrap. Next. The Canadiana continued ferrying passengers back and forth to Crystal Beach until 1956 when it was permanently retired from service. Park owners cited declining revenue and high maintenance on the 46-year-old ship as the reason for ending ferry service, but it was riding on board all that summer that finalized the decision. Next. The ship sold many times over, going to Michigan and Ohio before returning to Buffalo for restoration in 1984. The friends of the Canadiana tried to raise funds to restore her, but were unable to raise enough. In 1996, the Canadiana was towed to a place near the Welland Canal in Port Colborne, where it sank into the shallow water. It remained there until 2004 when it was cut up for scrap. Next. Let's go to the beach. Next. The beach was the place to escape the sweltering city heat. Lake Erie's cool water and refreshing breezes were bombed to the spirit. In this photo, to your extreme left, is the second bathhouse, which was connected to the pier by a covered boardwalk. Tunnels led from the beach to the bathhouse, as bathing attire was not permitted on the boardwalk. Next. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, the beach was an inexpensive place to go for getting there would cost only the round trip aboard the Canadiana. Most summer days, the beach was so crowded not a grain of sand could be seen. Next. The beautiful golden sand of Crystal Beach drew sunbathers throughout the next decade. Although heavy pollution during the 1970s threatened Lake Erie's beaches, Crystal Beach owners kept the beach as clean as possible. Next. In the early 1980s, Lake Erie and its beaches were declared clean. This became a revival time for Crystal Beach as patrons crowded the sand and partook in numerous activities like skidoo races, jet skis, sail surfing, and beach volleyball. 
part of the bathhouse was converted into Schooner's Beach Club in 1987, extending the excitement of the beach well into the night. Next, the ballroom. Next, dancing had always been an important activity at Crystal Beach. A small open-air pavilion hosted dances until popcorn vendor George C. Hall purchased Crystal Beach Park in 1924. He took down the 60-foot sand dune next to the lake. Local fire departments washed the sand into the water with their steam pumps and hoses. Horses and mules were used to level the land. Next. A concrete break wall and promenade were built up to the shoreline before the actual ballroom was constructed. The break wall ran the length of the park and was embedded with dancers and every other section. Next. The ballroom opened in 1925. It became the center of the park as it was used for more than just dancing. Park offices occupied the second floor, and in the basement were men and women's restrooms, a coat check, a bowling alley, and an archery range. Next. Patios on either side of the ballroom gave dancers a chance to exit the building and cool off in the lake's fresh breezes. Sliding glass doors opened up the ballroom to the outdoors, which kept the dancers from overheating. Next. The truss work of the ballroom's interior spanned a large open space without inner supports. The scanner lever design produced the largest unobstructed dance floor in North America at a whopping 160 feet by 230 feet. Next. Most of the great big bands played the Crystal Ballroom, from Les Brown and his band of renown, Tommy Dorsey with young crooner Frank Sinatra, to Jimmy Dorsey and Harold Austin. In between the big band appearances, local bands from Buffalo, Fort Erie, and Toronto performed in the Crystal Ballroom. Next. Dancing ended in the ballroom in the early 1960s as the popularity of the swinging big band sound faded away in favor of rock and roll. Like many other ballrooms across North America, the Crystal Ballroom began a new life as a roller skating rink. Two walkthrough attractions were constructed in 1966 in the basement and the pierside patio was converted into the antique car ride. Next. In 1974, a fire broke out in one of the walkthroughs in the basement. Although the quick response of the local fire department saved the ballroom, its beauty was marred forever. When the ballroom was remodeled after the fire, a pirate dark ride called the Jolly Roger was placed in the rear of the building and a restaurant was added in the front. Additional space at the front was taken up by the new restrooms. Next. By 1983, the Jolly Roger Pirate Ride had been removed and the rear portion of the ballroom was restored to its former glory. The following season, dancing returned to the ballroom with the revival of swing. The space was also used for different events and rock concerts. Next. Crystal Beach underwent many changes over time. The Great Depression of the 1930s saw a decline in park attendance, and in 1931, the park was placed into receivership. George C. Hall reorganized his company and retained ownership with his sons. Attendance started picking up around 1936. Next, let's go on the rides. The rides were the main attraction on the Crystal Beach Midway. Next. These mechanical fun machines shook us up. Next. Spun us around. Next. Lifted us into the sky. Next. Turned us upside down. Next. Tested our driving skills. Next. Took us on an adventure. Next. Scared us. Next and made us scream. Next. The Great Depression of the 1930s nearly ended Crystal Beach, but the park managed to survive and all because of one ride. Next. The phenomenal increase in attendance in 1936 was credited to a new attraction on the Midway, the Laugh in the Dark. The ride was built into an existing structure that had once been a bowling alley and pool hall. Next. During the park's opening weekend, long lines wove across the midway toward the old mill. The Laugh in the Dark was the first ride to make a profit since the Depression had begun. 
Converting the bowling alleys into the oriental design dark ride saved the park enough money to realize revenue in the black before the season ended. Next. Couples enjoyed the ride, liking the darkness for some quick canoodling in between startling stunts. The light cars, the tight cars, sorry, encouraged closeness, and the darkness encouraged young ladies to grab hold of their fellows. Next. Many of the stunts had simple mechanical movements. They were activated when the car wheels rolled over carefully placed magnets on the floor. There were 13 floor stunts, including a kicking mule, Wimpy and Popeye, and dancing skeletons. Next. The entire exterior was designed with the oriental theme. Flaring trim on the tower eaves gave them a pagoda look. Die cut figures were mounted at eye level along a narrow platform that was against the tin sheeting of the loading area wall. Next. Die cut figures were also mounted on the sides of the towers. In one of the towers, Charm and Charlie, a robe skeleton, played his off-key piano all day long. Next. Laughing Sal, a mechanical woman with an infectious laugh and a bad wardrobe, occupied the other tower. Sal rocked back and forth as she laughed, wearing out her dress each season. Her new dresses were often supplied by George Hall's wife. Next. The magic carpet was built in 1947. The exotic building with its onion dome towers, needle thin spires, and crescent moons was a walk through fun house. The fanciful palace was an enticing maze of dark rooms, outdoor and indoor corridors, slanted floors, slides, and twisting passageways. Next. The patrons loved the crazy mirrors in the gallery that stretched and squashed their images, the slanted room, and the whirling dervishes seen here. But most people tried to avoid the puffs of air that shot through the floors. A trip through the fun house ended in a ride down the magic carpet. Next. Over time, the carpet wore out. Increasing insurance costs and vandalism by some riders forced the removal of the carpet in 1971. The exit was revamped to bypass the old carpet room, and patrons left through the former chicken door. Next. With the removal of the carpet, the attraction was renamed the Magic Palace. A few changes were made inside to appeal to modern day youth, but the fun and mystery never changed. Next. The heart of the park. Next. In 1910, Crystal Beach replaced its old steam-powered carousel for an electric-powered one. Built by Philadelphia Toboggan Company in 1906, the Menagerie Carousel quickly became the most beloved ride in the park. Next. Besides the animals, the carousel had four chariots, two on the inside of the platform and two on the outside of the platform. The outside chariots were elaborately carved, one with a cupid and love doves, and the other with a cherub and a swan. Next. Crystal Beach's carousel had three rows of animals and horses, numbering 45 figures in all. The two inside rows had jumping figures, and the outside row had stationary figures. Next. When the park facades were replaced with Art Deco decorations, fluorescent and neon lights were added to the carousel. Next. For many park visitors, the carousel is the first ride of the day and the last ride before leaving the park. Next, the roller coasters. Next, the most exciting rides at Crystal Beach were the roller coasters. The first roller coaster, the figure eight, arrived on the Midway in 1901. This modern thrill ride wowed patrons with spine tingling dips, crisscross pattern, and the high speed of five miles per hour. Next. In 1906, a new roller coaster, the Back Knee Back Scenic Railway, debuted. It had a section of track sticking straight up in the air. As the train rolled up on this track, a switchman inside the station changed the track over, and the train rolled backwards onto a new section of track. This was the predecessor to the forward, backward, boomerang style roller coasters of today. Next. The unique configuration of the backity back included a two-story dark tunnel on the back turns. Considered a fast ride for its time, it thrilled riders with a number of hills and dips. Next. 
The cars are basic benches bolted onto a rolling platform. There were no seat belts or lap bars. A brakeman rode in each of the trains. It was his job to control the speed around the turns and on the dips. The backity back operated until 1926. Next. In May of 1916, the giant coaster, a side friction coaster, took its passengers on a speedy, thrilling, safe ride. Next. The original layout had a U-turn on the final run that sent the train alongside Erie Road before returning to the station. Next. The Giant was reconfigured during the 1920s. The U-turn was removed and the bunny hop section was pulled into the center of the ride. This change added a more thrilling element to the coaster, although shortening it by several feet. Next. In the late 1940s, the entire Midway was revamped with Art Deco and neon lights. The giant station became an Art Deco delight with circular columns and a sleeping facade that imitated its rolling hills. The lettering of its name was simply painted on, and as the years passed, new paint obliterated the name altogether. Next. Without a visible name, the giant became known as the Yellow Coaster because of its paint. It had 35-foot first drop wide turns, and shallow drops. When Crystal Beach closed in 1989, the Giant was the oldest ride in the park at 73 years old. Next. In 1926, the most terrifying roller coaster the world has ever known opened at Crystal Beach Park. Although roller coasters built today are faster and higher than the Cyclone, it still holds claim to the terror title. Next. Park owner George C. Hall had gone to roller coaster designer Harry Traver and asked him for the roughest, wildest coaster in the world, and he got it. Traver called the curving first drop a spiral dip, but patrons called it the drop into hell. Next. There were a few straight pieces of track on the cyclone. Its wicked twists and turns and disorientating figure eight element under the station often injured riders. Some even fainted. A nurse was hired to stay in the station at all times. Next. Looking to your far left, you can see what appears to be a loop in the structure. It was actually a steeply banked double helix. The trains never went upside down. By the 1940s, more people were watching the cyclone than riding it. In 1946, it was completely dismantled, ending a 20-year reign of terror. Next. Without the cyclone, the giant worked alone during the summer of 1947. Patrons arriving at the park on board the steamships at the start of 1948 saw a major change. A new roller coaster stretched along the old promenade. It was the Comet. Next. The Comet was designed by Herbert Schmeck of the Philadelphia Toboggan Company. Most of its steel supports came from the cyclone. The rest of it was manufactured at Lackawanna Steel. Although its structure was steel, its track was made of nine layers of wood, which designates it as a wooden coaster. Next. The comet was massive. Stretching along the promenade and doubling around itself, it was a length of three football fields. The first hill rose 96 feet in the air, and it was four feet above lake level, which made it from the very top of the hill 100 feet high from the bottom of the lake bed. The comet had four tight turns, a double down element, and 14 hills. Top speed was 55 miles per hour, although it often seemed to go faster. Next. While not as wicked as its ancestor, the comet still provided thrill seekers with plenty of fun and entertainment. It attracted a following that remains loyal to this day. Roller coaster enthusiasts from all over the world continually rate the comet as one of the world's top 10 wooden coasters. Next. For most kids who went to Crystal Beach between 1948 and 1989, their first ride on the Comet was a rite of passage, a graduation from Kiddie Land to the adult Midway. That first ride gave you bragging rights for the rest of the year. With its lakeside location, the Comet had its own fear factor and could make a rider a roller coaster enthusiast or break them from ever riding a roller coaster again. Next. The Comet survived the closing of Crystal Beach Park. Charlie Wood, who owned the Great Escape in Lake George, New York, at the time of the auction, purchased the Comet for $210,000. The Comet made its inaugural run at Great Escape for the first time 
1994 and is still giving exhilarating rides today. Next. The Wild Mouse gave its first ride at Crystal Beach in 1955. A compact roller coaster, it was, in its way, more frightening than the comet. Tight turns gave the illusion that the car would go right off the track. Next. Taken from the top of the ride, this photo shows sharp hairpin turns. Not everyone got off this coaster smiling. There were no brakes on the ride except in the station, so the cars maintained a fast speed throughout the winding course. Riders screamed the summer away on the Wild Mouse until its final season in 1981. Next. The Flitzer was a small portable coaster with tight descending turns and low steep hills, which gave the illusion of breathtaking speed. The track wound in and out of the facade that was painted with race cars. The Flitzer lasted from the late 1970s to the mid-1980s. Next. The Galaxy joined the roller coaster lineup in 1986. Sitting alongside the beach, it looked huge, but in reality, it was a compact coaster that took riders on a fun ride through helixes and a couple of steep drops. Lasting only two seasons, the Galaxy was the park's answer to the lost wild mouse. Next. Yum. Treats. Next. The treats at Crystal Beach were quite memorable. Visitors had a wide variety to choose from. Twisted frozen custard cones at the Creamy Whip stand, hard dipped cones at the Dairy Bar, and throughout the park, freshly made candy apples, caramel corn, Hall's Kisses, and suckers. Although not a sweet treat, fresh hot french fries doused in malt and vinegar was always a favorite. Next. Few patrons left the park without a sugar waffle tucked into a grease absorbing paper, brown paper bag. The sugar puff stand always had a line wrapped around it as evening fell, and patrons patiently waited to purchase multiple waffles to take home. Next. Hall suckers were a summertime ritual. Distinctive to Crystal Beach, the suckers were first hawked for a penny each by George Hall during his time as a concessionaire. The same recipe was used right up until the last days of the park. Like the comet, both the waffles and the suckers have survived and continue to be sought after treats. Next, Kitty Land. Next, since the 1920s, rides made just for children had been scattered around the park. With the end of World War II and the sudden baby boom, more and more patrons arrived at the park with toddlers and strollers. Crystal Beach owners capitalized on this and moved all the kiddie rides into its own section between the picnic grove and the carousel. Next. The Art Deco entrance was replaced in 1964, and Kittyland Land was renamed Frolic Land. The little park within a park was fenced in so parents could relax on a bench while their kitties safely ran from ride to ride. The strategic placement of Kitty Land meant that families never had to go on to the midway if they didn't want to. Next. A majority of the rides in Kitty Land were built right across the lake at the Allen Herschel factory in Buffalo, formerly of North Tonawanda. These rides included the rodeo rides seen here. Next. The Sky Fighter. Next. Helicopters. Next. Boat Ride and the Little Dipper. Next. Patronage in Kittyland began to die out in the early 1970s as a new generation of parents were having fewer children. Baby boomers had outgrown the little rides they loved so much. By 1980, the little park had changed drastically. Only six rides and one bounce house remained in Kittyland, and it was no longer enclosed with a fence. Next, the final years. Next. For three decades, George Hall's sons, Ed Fillmore and George Jr., had been operating the park. His grandsons, Van and Bob, took over operations in 1974. Major changes occurred with change in management. Old favorites like the Looper, Jungle Land, and Hay Day were permanently removed. Next. New rides were brought in, but they usually didn't last longer than one season. In 1976, park entrances were enclosed, and a pay-one-price admission was charged. Next. Locals 
Cottage residents and older visitors disliked the new admission policy. They were used to wandering into the park to simply walk around or buy a waffle or a Logan Berry drink. Thrill seekers loved the new admission price because they could ride as often as they liked. Still, attendance began to drop. Next. The Sawmill River Flume debuted in 1981. It was the last significant ride added to the park. Next. It was the tallest flume ride at that time, going up to the top of the sand dune and meandering through the trees before splashdown. Next. The 1980s was the most turbulent decade in the park's history. Ownership changed twice before the park went into receivership for back taxes in 1983. New owners took over in 1984. Next. The beloved carousel was sold piecemeal at the end of that season. Next. Along the midway, rides were replaced by game booths or flower beds. During the celebration of Crystal Beach's centennial in 1988, only a few events were held to mark the milestone, and those were poorly attended. Next. The park lost many company and school picnics to the competition, as there wasn't enough excitement on the midway to bring people back to Crystal Beach. Next. The summer of 1989 saw visible signs of the park's imminent demise with the destruction of the game booths behind the auto scooters and the lack of rides in the park. The announcement came in late August that Crystal Beach Park would close forever after Labor Day weekend. Next. Hundreds of people poured through the park's gates Labor Day weekend. There were long lines for every ride in the park. The line for the Commons stretched all the way to the train station. Next. Ironically, the park experienced its busiest and most profitable weekend in more than a decade. It was a sad statement that the park's closing was the reason for the successful attendance. Next. Camera crews from TV stations as far away as Toronto and Cleveland descended upon the park, interviewing patrons who admitted they hadn't been to Crystal Beach in years. Many people brought their kids to the park for the first and the last time. Those who had remained loyal to the park avoided the media circus to ride the rides and say goodbye to the place that had been so much a part of their lives. Next. In October of 1989, everything was auctioned off to the highest bidder, from the rides, stands, equipment, benches, lampposts, right down to the smallest nail. And with the final flood of the auctioneer's gavel, Crystal Beach Park began to vanish into history. Next. But all is not lost. As long as we have our memories and share them, Crystal Beach Park lives on. Next. And now it's time for the commercial. In 2004, I published Next, the first book on Crystal Beach Park, called Crystal Memories, 101 Years of Fun at Crystal Beach Park. My brother came up with the name. This past April, I released the fourth and final version of the book, in a limited edition. There are less than 100 copies left as of today. It is coffee table sized with black and white and colored photos and tells the entire history of the park. Next, the book is $30 and if you would like a copy, please email me at this address. It is only available through me. I mentioned that you attended this program and you will get free shipping. And I hope that everybody enjoyed their memories. Thank you so much. Rose, thank you so much for walking us through that. That was wonderful. Thank you. Okay, let's see. We've got some questions and comments here, and we can also give it a minute as folks process that. I'm sure you stirred up a lot of fun memories for them. So, oh, I'm seeing thanks for this walk down memory lane. I'm seeing our family had the best memories there. Um, somebody is wondering where their seatbelts on that terrifying roller coaster back in the 20s. No, just a lap bar. Just a lap bar, really? Yeah, that's all. In fact, there was uh, an accident, and it uh, turns out it was um, my, the, my father's neighbor. Uh, the gentleman stood up um, while the ride was in motion and was thrown from the car, and uh, the car hit him on its return on the track below um, 
which unfortunately uh, killed him. And um, the courts uh, granted favor in his family's um, direction and had Crystal Beach pay them. It was over like $3,500. Even though they had inspected the train and saw that the lap bar was in its proper position and witnesses had said that the man stood up. He may have stood up because he was so terrified. I don't know. Oh, but yeah, wow. just a lap bar. Wow. Okay. That is wild. Um, we have um, people at the Akron Senior Center saying we miss it. We have um, enjoyed your presentation. We'll contact you later to purchase a book. Wonderful. Thank you. We have amazing history, great picks. Thanks. I remember a car driving ride. Did you have a pick of that? Uh, can you repeat that? They're saying um, amazing history, great picks. Thanks. I remember a car driving ride. Did you have a pick of that? Um, you're talking about the turnpike. I, I did not actually have a picture of that in this presentation. Uh, yes, that the turnpike lasted from the late 1940s until the late 1960s, and it went through two different sets of cars. The original cars were diesel fuel, and the second set of cars that were actually purchased from a similar ride at the 1964-1965 World's Fair uh, were electric, and uh, were they ran with a cable along the track rather than independently. Okay, thank you for that, Rose. You're welcome. I'm seeing next, my father was a huge Cyclone fan and did nothing but complain about what a baby ride the Comet was. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have, I was on the wild mouse. I buried my face into my boyfriend's back. What a ride, and I'm still talking about it 60 years later. Thank you for this presentation. Oh, you're welcome. That's a great story. We have, what an enjoyable and memorable trip down Crystal Beach memory lane. My family practically lived there during the summer weekends of my childhood. Oh, um, every year, Iroquois guests had their picnic there, loved the ice cream truck. Oh, neat. Let's see, we have Turnpike, my mom's fave. And then I'm seeing we loved the wild mouse. Wow. That was one of my favorites. That looks pretty neat. Okay. Oh, because we spent many, many hours at the Penny Arcade. Cool. Okay, we've got another thing that came through. Um, a wonderful way, way to reminisce on a summer day. I remember a local supermarket would review your report card and you would get a certain number of tickets for each A or B. Great presentation, wonderful job. Yeah, the report card days were a big deal for sure. Especially if you were a kid that got all A's, it was a day to ride up free all day and your dad was excited because mm. he didn't have to buy a ticket. <laughs> I'm seeing, let's see. Thank you, Rose. This was wonderful. I didn't remember delinquent taxes. Uh, is there any truth to the story? I heard that there were too many locals who were only seasonal employees and then didn't work over the winter. Um, yes, most of the employees were seasonal, but they came back every year. Uh, there was a maintenance crew that included Sam Aquilina, who was the comment manager. Uh, they they were the gentlemen that worked all year round, and they did the repairs and the painting and greasing and anything that needed to be done during the winter um, was done. And then they were would usually start putting the park together in mid-April. Okay, thank you for the background. A lot of things pouring in here. If that's okay, I'll keep continue reading. Do you have the time? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, we have. Enjoyed your talk. We went on Westinghouse Day. It's pretty neat. Uh, we have my dad was also part of the Save the Canadiana group. He was on it when it was towed back to the Outer Harbor in the middle 80s. Oh, wow. Um, 
Someone's wondering, how did Crystal Beach become so important to you? Just loved it as a kid. Can you touch on your passion for Crystal Beach? Well, my, my parents didn't have a lot of money, so um, even though they couldn't afford to rent a cottage, we would go to Crystal Beach. Um, we had, um, you know, the school picnics and company picnics where my dad worked and where my grandfather worked. So we were over there quite a bit, and usually my birthday's around Memorial Day, so we would head out Memorial Day, and I just thought that that was my birthday celebration, going to Crystal Beach. And I just loved every aspect about it. So I still miss the park. But I go out and ride the Comet at the Great Escape as often as I can. Oh. Well, that's nice that you still have that piece of history to look forward to. Absolutely. Let's see. Somebody says, I remember Nickel Day and my mom and her sister happy to drink Canadian beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my dad was big on the Canadian beer, too. He used to try and sneak home some over the border. <laughs> uh, we have your historic photos were amazing. Most of them I never saw before. What a great presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, we have. My first trip on the Comet had me riding solo in the second seat from the front, which had me rocking back and forth the whole ride. It actually took away my upset stomach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to get a single ride on the Comet. They usually try to put two people in because you did slide around on the seat a lot. And Rose, can you just remind us where the Comet ended up, please? We have somebody asking. Yes, um, it's now at Six Flags Great Escape in uh, Lake George, New York. It's about a six-hour drive from here. And they do have a website. You can check it out. All right, thank you. Uh, next we have Can't Forget Neighborhood Days like North Buffalo Day and Kenmore Day. Yeah, Neighborhood Days are big, big deals. Uh, as soon as that ticket booth showed up on the corner of a major intersection, everybody was running to get tickets. That was the time. That was the time when your parents would let you go on the bus to a different country by yourself, and nobody had a problem with it. <laughs> no cell phones or anything like that either. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Let's see. This one says, "I of course had some of my own great memories: Laugh in the Dark, the Giant Coaster, the Comet, etc. I was there the last weekend it was open. Dad and I rode the Comet backwards." And I was five months pregnant. I really miss that place. Beats Darien Lake any day. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's for sure. And we have somebody wondering, um, were they able to salvage any of the Canadiana or Canadiana? Beautiful pics of it. Um, there is the anchor at the waterfront park, which is the little strip of beach that sticks out from where the comet's turnaround was and where the palm wood used to be, that's no longer there. And um, I believe somebody has the uh, wheel from the wheelhouse in a private collection. And then um, when they were cutting it up, they were um, selling pieces of wood. So a lot of people have little pieces of wood of the Canadiana. Wow. wow. Thank you. Um, this next person says, I miss everything about Crystal Beach. Thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. And then, remember the garbage collection spots with the talking lion and pig, encouraging everyone to feed them a clever way to keep the park clean. That's true. Everybody loved Leo the lion and Porky the pig. And there's one, um, Porky the pig is actually in a little park called Storybook Park in um, uh, London, Ontario, but he's more of a water fountain now than he is sucking garbage. And there is also a Porky the Pig um, at another park uh, down down in Pennsylvania called Knobles. And um, he's, he's actually in a house, not a mushroom, but he, he still sucks up garbage. Oh. I've been to Knobles. I'll have to look for that next time I go. It was near the Alamo last year. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Somebody's wondering, what's at the site now? It's all high, supposedly high-end um, houses. 
Uh, people live there year round. Some people just live there during the summer. Uh, the only thing left is the break wall and part of the pier. That's it. Okay. Uh, somebody's wondering what happened to the ride that was like a tricycle. I don't know. A lot of the rides were were sold off in auction at the end, so I, I'm some of them went to you know carnivals and other parks. But there was never a complete list of where everything went, so that's one of the rides I was never able to follow through on. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, this person is telling us we had some pieces of the Canadiana. Once my parents passed, I donated all items I had left to the Buffalo History Museum. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. That's great. And then we have somebody saying, we love Knobles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> okay, and I'm just seeing a couple more thank yous. Thanks for your talk. Looking forward to getting your book. So, Rose, thank you so much for doing this for us today. You're welcome. I'm so glad everybody enjoyed it. Absolutely. And everyone who's on, thank you. And I'll be able to post it hopefully by the end of the week so you can share it with your friends. And uh, Rose, I'll give you a call in a couple seconds. And everyone else, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.